think we're back here. Is everybody good to go here? Sorry about that, little technical difficulties. Um, but today we're gonna go through our full swing process a little bit here. Um, we're gonna talk about what we're doing when we see a golf swing for the first time. We've given you a little bit of the background information on like how to, from a coaching process, we know how to read ball flights, we know what TrackMan's telling us. But just in, in like, you got the lesson in front of you and you're trying to analyze the swing. And we're gonna talk about, you know, some of our processes and then go through some swings that the, uh, the group set in. So first thing I'm doing when I get um, a new student on the, or even a repeat student on the range, I'm seeing their full motion, seeing how the club and the body are moving in relation to each other. And I think the first question I'm asking myself is, what do I wanna keep? What do I wanna build this person's swing around? Whether they have a nice wrist position or a nice club face position or a lot of power, I'm always thinking what I wanna keep first instead of what I wanna change first. Um, that's really helped me evolve as a teacher. And then what I'm also thinking there is what's the first compensation that the student makes that influences the shot or the problem that I'm trying to fix. So during a swing, usually when you see a problem, you're seeing the effects of a much earlier cause. You're gonna see that a lot today in the seminar. You're gonna see a lot of swings that we're talking about where we're seeing the result and we're gonna actually be working on what's causing that result way earlier. So the influence is happening way before you see the, uh, the, the negative feedback result. So the, the students in front of you hitting balls, these are the, some of the things that are going through our mind um, and our thoughts during the lesson. This is happening sometimes without us thinking about it because we've just been teaching for so long. I'm looking at the forces and the torques on the club. I'm looking at the sequencing, if he's swaying, body positions, wrist positions? Does it look like there's a physical limitation? Does it look like he's gonna get injured? And then when we're doing this, um, I've got the good fortune to be using this you know, swing callus force plates out here. I'm looking at the way their vertical uh, torques and lateral displacements are working on that, on that machine. I'm also looking at their body in a couple areas. I'm looking at their displacements and I'm looking also at their rotation. So obviously in a body, you you can rotate, you can tilt, you can side bend, you can bend. There's a whole bunch of different angles. So I'm looking at it from a linear perspective as a, and also as, as well as angles. When you combine that with when you're getting feedback from a track man machine or you're getting your, your feedback from a ball flight laws whenever last week from what you're seeing the ball do, um, there's a lot going on that you can hopefully study up pretty fast and see the relationship of all those at the same point in time. So we're, we're, as we're going through all this and we have all the data and the information or whatever you're, you're, you're using, you're trying to pick like the lowest hanging fruit for the student in front of you, something that they can handle that's gonna, gonna make the most of, uh, amount of changes the easiest, the way, easiest way we can. And I would say also when you're working with an average player, so we're gonna call it the weekend golfer, um, when they're coming in for a lesson, I view them as a sinking ship and I'm trying to fix the biggest hole possible the biggest hole possible is gonna stop them from sinking and hopefully to get them back on top of the water. When we're working with a player who's a tournament golfer, obviously their game's probably in pretty good shape. Um, I may not be going for that biggest hole. I may be going and going, okay, this is where our first development needs to change and then we can go ahead and move on from there. So you may you know, tailor your lessons in terms of who's in front of you and what they're expecting to get out of you, how fast. So. We're going to talk a lot, or like I know Pat and I talk about it a lot in our lessons, are the forces and torques that are applied on the club that make things happen in the swing. And when you look at still frames in, in pictures, you can't really see the whole story. And, and so that first statement there, you can't see the forces and the torques. Um, they're just be, we're just being able to measure them, actually. So it's like, but those have a lot of application in why things are happening in the swing. Um, we're going to go through that, I think, in every lesson we're going to go through you're going to see some result on that today and what you'll notice is this a force is like a direction it's a direction that we'll say the grip is, is, is a good idea the grip movement and the force usually dictates what the torque and how the twisting of the club is working so a lot of what we're going to look at is the movement creates a twisting of undesired or desired results depending on the student so that's what a torque is, is a twisting. A force is more of a direction. I think forcing like you're pulling your hands down or you're, you're pushing your hands out. All that's gonna apply a twisting on the club face or an application on, on something that's desirable or undesirable. And what I would also say is the bottom line is remember what you wanna keep. 
you could actually build your your students' golf swing and golf game around what you're trying to keep and build everything around that. That's a very good idea. Okay, so um, first got to send um, – they're swinging here. It's actually my boss, so I'm going to be very tricky here. Um, you're doing everything great. Just keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just getting here. So we'll play it for the group. Um, the swing is going to be in a loop here. So some of the feedback that he's given me was he, ha he, he wants to hit a draw, and he has a two-way miss with his driver, gets a little inconsistent. So I'm going to walk you through a couple of things that what I see with, uh, with Jason's swing, and we can get him hitting, uh, hitting his driver a little bit better. So this is an example of a still frame, not telling the whole picture. So the moment of truth oftentimes is found in the transition, not in the impact position. So I use that because, like, you typically hear golf instructors say the moment of truth is, is impact, but really it's the transition. And you're going to see a theme in all of our lessons today that the transition is what causes impact. So it's really, uh, really prevalent here. But for Jason Swing, um, the thing that stands out for me is how open the club face is at that late in the downswing. So when I see that, it's going to influence a two-way miss for him. It's going to say if his body stalls, he's going to hook it. And if his body rotates, he's going to slice it. And if you're not playing golf every day when we're working all the time, like it's going to be really hard to time that out. So the story of how his club face got there is really important. When the club is open and your hands are this far out, we're in trouble. So what happens in the transition is his arm, his right arm goes out towards the golf ball excessively. So you can see in the, um, the bottom left corner video or the picture, you can see the shaft is above his right forearm. The hands are going out, out towards the golf ball, resulting in an overly open club face very late in the downswing. So you have desire, like if, if I could pick a, a, a motion to have a preference, I would have a hand path that would go from a very neutral backswing, where you can see on the left picture, to a very neutral downswing or slightly behind it. Now, there are players on the PGA Tour, I think Matt Kuchar, he, his hands go out. Rory McIlroy's hands get deep. There's, uh, you know, there's a lot of consistency and a lot of variations on it. But if I could choose, I would have it a little bit deeper or neutral. So with Jason, I've got to figure out why his hands are going out and what's the first thing that causes his hands to go out so the club face gets really open. So here would be a, my lesson review for, for Jay, and it's going to – Audio should be playing. Make sure your speakers are up for this. Jay, thanks for sending your uh, video in here. Um, I wanted to go over your swing. We can go at it a little bit in depth. And I'm going to explain to you why you do what you do. And then I'm also going to talk about, like, summing it up and how to practice it and how to get better with it. So first things first, your posture, your upper spine, where it's really rounded in this area, it's causing a little bit of an issue in how your arms hang, are hanging at a dress. If you see Tiger, his handle of his club somewhere up near his belt or almost near his belly button, where because your right arm is out in front of you, your hands get really low at a dress, okay? So that's going to really influence how the club is moving in your backswing. When you move the club back, you have a lot of early forearm rotation. Your right elbow is pushing down towards your right hip bone, and then you see your head back up off the ball. So... That movement now is going to create your elbows being, your right elbow being overly under your left on your backswing because you're, you lack a, a lot of pivot and shoulder turn early in your backswing, okay? So you can see Tiger, his elbows would be much more level and there's much more turn and structure to that position. So because of the way your right arm works at the top of your backswing, you can see your hands go up and towards your right ear at this point. Because of that motion, the forces and torques on the club now push your hand path way out in front of you. So at this point in your downswing, your left arm is way out in front of your, the bill of your cap, where Tiger it would be out more under his chin. Yours would be almost out too far out in front of you. Okay? Because of that, your club face gets really, really open as a result. You can see your club face is significantly more open at this position. At that point, you have no chance but to either stall or use a lot of active hands through impact to try to square the face up, okay? So you, you have so little time to get to the ball in that point in your swing to be as consistent as you want to be.
All right, so going back to the fixes, what you need to do, get your shoulders back so it's gonna feel maybe a little bit straighter upper back, your posture, your pelvis is gonna be a little bit more neutral and your hands, the height of it, is gonna be a little bit higher at address. From there, your right arm on the backswing is gonna work differently. You're gonna to try to keep your right arm maybe a little bit straighter at this position. So you're gonna to have turned a little bit sooner. And then you're gonna get your left arm to feel deeper at the top of your backswing. So your left arm is gonna be more in this position than going up and around. And your right elbow is gonna be much lower. So your hand depth is gonna be much, much deeper. Okay? That as a result is gonna help your hands, your left arm stay way deeper in your downswing. So the reason and the story of how your backswing works with your right arm and your posture is pretty much causing a lot of the effects you see on the downswing. On the downswing, like the next step to that would be maybe flexing your left wrist a little bit in the downswing to get the face a little bit more neutral at this position. But until that changes in the backswing, that fix isn't going to be relevant. So posture, hand depth, left arm depth at the top will all help how you make your transition and make you more consistent. So that would be like a sample, um, you know, a quick video that I would send to a student. Um, Jay, you know, I'll see him at work hopefully soon and I'll take credit for all the bad shots you hit after uh, trying some of this. But here are some other more still frames that I think are, are pretty prevalent. On the right, you can see how much more open um, the, the club face is. Club face goes from a closed to an open position. It's not conscious, it's just, what the forces and the torques on, on what, how he's applying uh, power or force on it is, is uh, promoting to that club face. So thanks for sending your video in, Jay. So some of the drills, two piece backswings. Um, I'd add in a little left arm adduction drill. You'll see a little bit later in the, in, in the uh, presentation. I could give him some feedback like a bender stick so his left arm gets deeper at the top so he has some awareness of where he's trying to get. Um, stop and go from a new position, fall above your feet, some simple ways to do it that are not invasive. All right, so here was our next swing that was sent in. Um, over there on the uh, left side, you can see kind of what this player was seeking out of us. Um, tr trying to hit a controlled fade uh, is what the op is, is what the opportunity here is. We're trying to control fade. And um, there's a little bit of information. So again, I thought this was a really cool um, still frame here is that there's more similar similarities than differences in, in this. If you just looked at this, I mean, the Hall of Fame is filled with, with these type of still frame pictures. It's beautiful. Um, so you think about First here, you think about like what you're trying to keep with the student first. Um, you know, the center of mass of the club heads behind the hands, the face is really neutral, the lead wrist is in a really good spot, pelvis open in relation to his torso, right elbows. There's so many good things to talk about in that position. So, yeah. so what you'll see here in the backswing is Comparing these two pictures right there, you see that the player on the left has got way more chest rotation at that point in time than, than Tiger over there on the right. And um, what that's causing is it's causing to get the grip and the club too far behind him at this point in time. And then at the top, the club's going to loop across the line a little bit because it's going to go from an inside position to a little bit of a lift, which then crosses the line. So the first thing that's kind of throwing out our, our little red flag is the fact that the early chest rotation is getting the club too far behind him at that point in time. So I'm just going to play in a loop kind of how his backswing is working so you can see the depth of his hands and how his right arm works around his body, that his hand path, instead of working up and around, it just works around it like his shoulders and his torso pivot is just controlling his hand depth. And I would add the fact that the main mover in this backswing from setup to about halfway back, maybe a little more than that, is basically just rib cage and chest rotation. Uh, the, the arms and the, and the wrist don't have a really active role until late in the backswing, which you're seeing right there at that point in time. So it's, it's, got, a, it's got a lot of spin early 
and then it's got a lot of lift late. And so when you think about his desired shot, it makes perfect sense on why he would want to fade it because he's so deep and over rotated. It's such a shallowing move in his swing. If he tried to get his attack angle up here, if he tried to get his attack angle to negative or positive three, he would have to get his hand, keep his hand so deep on the downswing and swing so far to the right, the shot would be much less under control. So his instincts as a player is telling him, yeah, I, I want to make sure I'm like not underneath so I'm able to hit a shot I can control. But from that deep of a backswing, if he were to hit up on it, he'd be in big trouble. So same kind of deal here. I'll show you a little bit of a, a review for him. All right, man. So thanks so much for sending in your video um, and your driver stuff. So you're talking about your attack angle being negative two and negative three and your desired shots to hit a fade. And so you want to hit the right shot on the course more often. So let's go through a couple things in your swing. So I want to start with how great of a job you do in your transition. Like this is an excellent job in how your left knee and your left hip are starting your downswing. They separate nice, a very stable pelvis. You get into a wonderful impact position here. That's beautiful. And then on this position here on the downswing, like the Hall of Fame right here is filled with similar downswings. Um, and like we've been talking about in some of our webinars is like the story of how the club gets there might be more important than the actual position we're showing. So what I would like to do is talk to you about your backswing and how over rotated your torso gets earlier in your backswing. So you're blessed with a lot of range of motion here. So I would say when your left arm is parallel to the ground, you've roughly got 90 degrees, maybe a little bit more than 90 degrees of shoulder turn at that point in your swing. The result of that is your hand path gets really deep. I'd like the butt of the club here to be over your right heel or your hand path to be in front of your right pec muscle. That would be like what I would use to have as a reference point for you if you're practicing with video. From there at the top of your backswing, your left arm is going to be in a little bit different position. Your elbow is going to be more in front of you and the club head is not going to be as across the line. What you have to do in order to not hook it from here is to get your hand path to go out, which causes some issues in consistency. You do a great job of recovering, but it can cause some issues in consistency. Remember, if I get really deep in my backswing, and my right arm goes behind me, and now I get steep early in the transition, I have to get shallow late. That shallow late part, that right here, that's when you get in trouble in your consistency. So simple, feel like you're turning less early in your backswing, the seam of your shirt right here, keep your right elbow in front of the seam of your shirt going back. It's gonna change the direction of your hand path so it's gonna be much, a much more neutral position. And then you'll be able to hit that fade that you desire, no problem. So our next analyzation here uh, was sent in to us. This is a uh, student of one of the professionals. Um, 72 year old gentleman. The first thing that I noticed about his swing was the fact he's got some great speed, I think, for his, for his age and for his size. I thought that was really positive. Um, and then you can see what the uh, instructor gave us his notes um, in terms of what they're working on. So on the right side of the screen, that's the actual impact position and the left side was, was the setup. So the first thing is we need to make the student aware of the contact point where he's hitting the club face at. And you can see how that contact point right there is uh, towards the heel. Um, so we need to make him aware as to what's going on there. And there's some alignment feedbacks that we're going to do with that in a second. So watching his swing on the way back, his arms and his shaft were very upright and in front of him, um, almost very much opposite of the, of the student that we just saw a minute ago. So he's, he's a very up and down motion. And that up and down motion on the way down, when his arms go out just a little bit, and the club has behind his arms, his baseline is just outside the ball. So we're going to want him to stand further from the ball. And that way his swing's going to feel more around, kind of like a baseball swing, or kind of like when you're playing off a side slope. So we're going to have him feel further from the ball. We're going to try to flatten around his backswing out. So here's a couple of drills. Um, the baseball swing, a ball above. Uh, a closed stance, that's going to have him feel like he's going to 
suck the grip back more inside in the backswing. Um, I would, you know, honestly, the, the last swing, like to, you know, give him that guy's backswing. That'd be great. Uh, and also, the closed stance will also help him uh, turn his pelvis more in the backswing uh, to turn him more away from the target, which is going to find some more depth. Now, I, I use a lot of um, negative space feedback. So I would actually put a, uh, a, a pool noodle outside the ball, about two inch tall pool noodle. And I would make sure that he's aware that his club cannot be on that. The middle of the club can never cross the target line. That's something that we're really, really big about. Um, and then the, the, the lead arm abduction, that's gonna get that left arm to feel more suck to his body in the backs and we're gonna have him more rounded. So we're definitely gonna round him out quite a bit. I think the key things of the drills that Pat came up with here were like, it fits the student. Like, you know, I'm not sure how long he could be hitting balls for, but these seem like when we talk about low hanging fruit, find a side slow, you spend 10 or 15 minutes doing that, give him some awareness. I feel like that could make a little big, like a huge difference in a short amount of time. And it's not super invasive with it. So this was a really cool one. I thought Joy is an awesome player. Um, for, Teacher of the year, awesome teacher, awesome player. Play, I think she's played the U.S. Senior Open the last two years, I believe. Um, so we're going to go through these swings together. I thought this was a really cool um, idea here for it. I'll let him play for a second. So with Joy, I'll preface that with I have her swings. I have some track man data. I don't, I don't, I've never seen her play. I don't know what shot she's trying to hit. So I'm going to give um, some some advice here without knowing what she's trying to do or what shot she, she really likes to see. But I can, I can help you with what, um, what I think from a swing, from a mechanical standpoint, where I would go with it. Here's her, her track man data. So the things that stood out to me here were the, her smash tracker. She hit it really solid. Um, ball didn't have a lot of curve to it. Um, very neutral numbers went really straight. Nice high shot, really good shot here. So when we talk about adduction, that's the difference between your, your left arm and your torso, um, that angle. So this video through gears is gonna give you a really good representation on it. And then what, what you see on 3D is for a short amount of time in the transition as your segments are changing positions, your left arm gets pinned against your, I shouldn't say really pinned, but it compresses against your chest a little bit in the transition, which is gonna allow Joy's hand path to get deeper earlier on the downswing. So her left arm movement is gonna work a lot different. So on the swing there on the right, the two swings over here on the right, you can see that her left arm is not really tight to her body at this point in time, as opposed to the player there on the far right. And that will change at impact where they're going to out, uh, actually reverse. Yeah. Where her left arm is going to get tired to her chest at impact. And the player there on the far right, his left arm is going to be leaving his chest because the upper body rotation is going to be um, not rotating as fast. It'll still be turning, but not as yeah. fast. And that's going to allow, allow the left arm to fire off. So the angle of your chin, like it's perpendicular. Your left arm is perpendicular to your torso. So the angle increases in the transition. And then your left arm actually will come off your chest in the downswing, um, providing, you know, really good dynamic loft and like a very neutral path to it. You can see that gears image is stopped over there. When the gears image was stopped at impact, it was almost nine degrees of angle from the left arm to the shoulder. And in Joy's swing, she's got that angle probably still about 45 degrees. So we're going to try to get that left arm to feel a little more free through impact. So it's going to feel stuck early and it's going to release late. So this is a great drill to represent that left arm adduction. Hand path deeper earlier on the downswing is going to lead to her left arm getting off of her chest at impact. And so I'm, again, I'm approaching this a little blind saying, watching Joy's swings here, I would say she might struggle with some contact that the ball might come up short and right. She might want to be able to hit a, a, a more of a, a higher draw off the tee. Maybe she wants to hit her three wood a little bit higher or her approach shots a little bit higher. Um, with her longer clubs, that's kind of where I'm approaching it from. That's where I could see uh, some of her misses come from. So you can see there, there's a lot of differences at impact where her left arm would be versus uh, the student on the right where his left arm is actually coming off of his chest uh, through impact. So now his left hand and his grip is more in front of his left thigh. And with Joy, it gets like stuck behind her just a little bit. So 
that would, so the story of changing impact would be like really early in the transition where her chest and her, how her chest and her left arm work. So her hand pass um, gets a lot more neutral. So the two drills I would do, I would have the, have, give her the motion drill that I had um, in the previous video. And I would actually have her hit some shots where like a small impact drill where she would actually let go of the club with her right hand and then keep her left arm extending. So she feels it kind of come off of her chest. Okay, so next up here, this is a um, member here of Bethesda Country Club who got his first lesson with me last fall. And these were his first couple swings. Uh, and the feedback that he gave me is there on the left side of the screen. Um, and, you know, for having quite a bit of speed, he didn't have a whole lot of distance with himself. So that's what we're working on there. So here's a little video I did for him. Here's a review from our lesson today. Over here on the swing left, this is our original swings of the day. Working on your consistency with your contact, um, you complained about the club hitting the ground too much behind the ball and shallowing out. So if you take it back, top of your backswing. I would love it to stop right there. So you can see over here on the right side of the screen, Based in the same position at this point in time, pretty darn close. What happens here on the left side is it carries on. That club crosses the line. You've got extra right elbow folding. So we got too much folding right here through the right elbow. I'd like the arm to stop right there where my lines are. As a result, the way down, your first move is from over rotating your shoulders to extra right elbow bend. Your upper body has to lead the downswing and steepens the club out. Over here on the right side, you can see you have less shoulder rotation, top of the backswing, less rotation. In the downswing, the club just comes down on plane. You're not having to start by unwinding your over rotating upper body. Much nicer position right there. So there was a review. Um, hopefully you guys heard it okay. So over here um, in the comparison right there, that's his swing where I like it to stop, and this is with the impact ball. Um, his swing obviously carried on much further than that when he wasn't uh, be being instructed. So the goal is, is the fact that when he takes it back, as much as, he, as, as far as he does, his left arm gets stuck across him and the club gets across the line. That's an ineffective backswing. A backswing to me is only supposed to be doing two things. Number one, it's supposed to create speed and power in the golf swing. And second thing is it's supposed to make the arrival back to the ball as easy and repeatable as possible. So if he did stop in that position here on the left side, if he did end up stopping right there, he'd have a lot easier time than he would from his normal swing. Obviously with the impact ball, he's got a much easier much easier chance to do that. The impact ball was basically um, instructing him not to get too close to himself with the impact ball and also trying to keep the connection with his elbows. So you can see here the results on the way down. The swing there on the far left, that's his transition of moving that long back swing. The club's coming in pretty steep. His arms are trying to work out towards the ball. They're trying to get Steve on top of the ball. It's all recovered from the top of the swing. He took it back. He, he unwound it from his chest too much because his chest was wound so much. And as a result, on the way down, he was really struggling to get consistent contact with the ground and the ball. His low point control was not very good. So now there on the right side, you'll see that the club is working on a much better plane towards the ball. And you can also see that from that position, the club is just going to be shallowly normal. So once again, we're back to the uh, torques and forces on the club is the fact that being in a much more neutral position at the top, he allowed the, the uh, forces and torques to kind of regulate themselves and not have that big over the top steepness. So like what I think is really cool about this is how different his right arm worked. And if you go back to our first lesson with, with Jason, it's like when the right arm works up and towards your right ear in the backswing and, and your elbow gets really wide and internally rotated in the downswing, you apply force out on the club there that gets you in a really tough 
position. And there's some similarities in, in those and how that the hand pass work in both of those, causing the face to get into a really extended position or the left wrist to get in really extended position or the face to get really open. And it just gets really hard to time out with it. And it's really cool. Like how often are you working on the right arm in, in the golf swing and how that controls like hand pass? I mean, all, all the time. All the time. I'm working on the right arm in terms of how it folds. Um, a trail arm, like not just for a left hand, it's the trail arm. The trail arm, yeah, for sure. And I mean, if you follow um, any Mike Adams, he's big on the right arm folding and how it folds and how it works. And that's a, and that's a big deal. I mean, once again, the backswing to me is about, you know, applying power to the ball and also being able to consistently do something. And if the right arm is working in a good way, the downswing becomes much easier. So, in like, we've gone through, I think, four or five guys right now, and it's we've seen the right arm get too deep. We've seen the right arm get too in front. You know, like, we've talked about the right arm a lot in these swings. And, and it's, it's, you know, it's as the teacher, you got to assess at what cost to the student. Like, what are they trying to do? And, like, you're, you're trying to figure out how that's affecting the motion. So, this is sent in by one of the professionals who's on the uh, – Webinar today. Brandon, you gotta hit in the fairway next time. They got, you know, come on. That's some serious rough you're playing out of there. So um, he didn't give us much feedback, but John Scott and I are looking at his swing. Um, we think he fights blocks and hooks, and we think he also fights um, a shallow angle of attack. Um, so that's what we're looking on there. So during the motion, his lower body moved towards a target in the downswing, excessive amount. Um, from spending a lot of time on 3D, like John Scott and I have done together, um, we know that the downswing, the lower body center is supposed to move forward maximum about three to four inches max. From the center of the pelvis. From the center of the pelvis and the transition to downswing. And when your lower body slides much more than that, something's got to give, which is typically your upper body falls back and you've got too much right side bend. It's also getting the club in the ground too early. Um, the next thing that Brandon's doing is his hands path in the downswing is deepening. So, I mean, if you would think about someone who's deepening their hands path, I mean, excessively, you would think about kind of like a Sergio Garcia who's got a lot of drop in. And so, so Brandon's got his own Sergio Garcia move with his overdone lateral motion of his lower body. That's two things that's shallowing out the downswing. And those two shallows, are going to be the result. It's going to be it's going to be a problem. It's going to be hitting behind it too much and trouble all the rough. So here's a little video review we did for him. Okay, Brandon. Thank you for sending your swing in. Over here on the left side of the screen, this is a picture of your top of your back swing. And the biggest thing I'm noticing right there is the distance that your knees are apart. So we're going to go back to the setup here, back to the beginning. We're going to look at the first thing is that your left knee and your right knee are both kind of twisted outwards. As you make your backswing, once again, we're focusing here on the left side of the screen. As you make your backswing, when you take it back, your left knee is actually moving towards the target at this point in time, and your right knee at the top of the backswing is actually moving away. So we've got this major double external rotation there in the backswing and in the transition phase. So I work on your setup, trying to get your knees to point more towards your big toes. The next thing I notice is the fact that in the downswing, when you bring it down, you've got a lot of lateral slide. So I'm gonna draw a line up here, up your left leg. And what I look for mainly is about half a leg through that line. And you can see that your entire left leg is past that line. It's a lot of lateral slide. That lateral slide is a shallow move Okay, and then when you combine it with the view here on the right side of the screen, when I bring it down, you can see how your hand path tracks underneath your backswing path. So your backswing was on the red line, your hand path on the green line, that's your downswing. And you can also see the club is significantly far behind you at that point in time. So that's two things shallowing your swing out. I would begin this by working on your setup, making sure that your setup that your knees are pointing towards your big toes as opposed to having your knees turning out. In the back swing, I work on trying to get my left knee to go more behind the ball and my right knee not to move out as much. From that position on the way down, I would try to eliminate the lateral slide as much as you do. There's your review. So 
so I put together a couple pictures from some, some old swings that I love um, for Brandon's setup, getting his pelvis a little bit more towards the target, his left hip a little bit higher than his right at address is going to help him turn. And then kind of like on the right, definitely being able to rotate his pelvis and straighten his right knee and get some depth in his hips is going to change, uh, you know, how he turns and makes the transition um, a ton during his swing. So I think like, it's very common. I, I see a lot of it in juniors right now, like when they're on social media or they're on Instagram or they see people like, or, or some widening their knees in their transition. I see that a lot right now. And it's like, you got to temper some of that, but it looks like he's trying to like externally rotate both of his knees or his, his hips at this point. So I would say Brandon, like load a little bit better. You can do all that later in the transition, um, but not on the back. Side. Definitely not on the back. And side. where I drew that blue circle, He's turning from his lumbar spine. He's turning yeah. from his lower spine. And the lumbar spine is not really designed to be turning. It's more of stability. Yeah. So, you know, potentially if his lower body was to keep doing the external rotation, he's not turning through his thighs, he's not turning properly, that, that could be injury, yeah. you know. And we're, we, you know, we're in the business trying to prevent injuries and, and, you know, everybody be able to play for a long time. So his lower body, I mean, I don't need to look like Jack Nicholas, but, you know, so restricted. It's quite op, you know, it's quite obvious opposite of what Nicholas was doing there. So don't do that anymore, Brandon. So this is some of the review, some of what Pat already went over. Yep, and this and the setup part, uh, the swing we just showed you, Sneed, right? Yeah. Uh, with Sam Sneed, you can see his the way his hips and his body were lined up. That's a big that's a big way to help your start out. But obviously, in the backswing. The external rotation is causing a huge issue. And I think that could be the ultimate reason why you slide so far past the ball because your legs are externally rotated like that. Um, I, I know my force plate, it would show that there's no lateral breaking in the left side available to you. And that's, a big, and that's a big problem right there. You may pick up a lot more speed, a lot more distance from having those knees and those thighs work better towards the ball. So finally today, this is our last little um, – case study. This is a member here in my club who came in for a uh, golf lesson and he's looking to hit 50 yard shots. And during these, during these slides here, we're going to talk about what the player's saying, what the player's saying and what I'm talking about. Um, on the very first slide, uh, which went by real fast there. Um, the player's goal was to gain distance control, and my goal was to gain better contact because there's no way you could repeat this contact. So he had to fall into my idea of, look, you don't have any distance control because you don't have any consistent contact. So these are the observations we're making right there. In the bottom, I asked the player, you know, why are you doing this? And there was his results. You know, he, he thought what he was trying to do was going to be helpful. So here we are in the backswing, and I'm going to draw a line here on the screen. At one point in time, his club head was in that blue circle in the backswing. We just took a still from the top of the backswing. But if you can imagine how that club got to the top of the backswing. So once again, I asked the player, what's up? And he said, I'm trying to create an outside in motion with a lot of wrist hinge, keep the face open. Well, you know, it doesn't really work that way. Outside in is kind of a bad, it's kind of a bad word in my, in my vocabulary. I want him to feel like he's creating an in to an inside motion. He's going to bring it down from the in and bring it back to the in. And his backswing is going to feel very conventional, like a normal backswing would feel. He doesn't need to feel that great pickup outside, okay? So there you can see on the right side the changes that we made. You can see where his hands path is now. It's much more on top of his toe line as opposed to out here where it's way in front of them. So that was the backswing move we did. Okay, here we are at impact on both. And you can see how much better his posture looks there on the right side. Um, he thought he was trying to hit the ground, like hard. He was trying to hit the ground really hard and try to have a lot of rehinge in the club. And you can also see that in the downswing, once again, his club at some point in time was on top of that blue circle going back into the ball, and it had to leave really fast. On this one here on the right side, it's working more down and through. That's that inside-to-inside -inside motion we're talking about. Um, 
you know, there's in a, in a minute we got to some. We have a slide that we, we put together with some nice teaching points, and one is that the center of the club should never cross the ball, and that's what this player was doing consistently. That looks scary on the left. Yeah. And, you know, once you see, he thought it was supposed to be an outside in motion. Well, he's definitely doing the outside thing right there. But, I mean, that's, we got to talk about how we're trying to get there. So, was he a better pitcher from the rough than the fairway with that motion, or was it just all the way around and consistent? When the ball was sitting up in the rough, he would actually go underneath the ball where the ball would just stay in place. And when the ball was on the ground, like on, on like a firmer lie, he would just take so much dirt and chunk, the ball would just run off. So ideal for him was maybe like first cut where it wasn't really sitting crazy up, but it was, I mean, it, it was bad on all fronts. And you can see there the post impact, the one on the left is the original one. I mean, that club's got so much rehinge and folding going on. And um, over there how, on the right. I love how tall he is on the right. Over there on the right, I mean, half the tallness is the fact he wasn't choking down on the bottom of the grip. Like his hands were actually off, off the grip at some point in time. And here's the ending motion. And as I said, um, when he left this lesson, his new goal was to find consistent, repeatable contact. And I, I told him, if you can find that, then distance control will take care of itself. I mean, he was basically blaming his, his distance control for, for his motion, not for his contacts. He had no idea what, what good and bad contact was on those shots. Where would we talked a couple seminars ago or webinars ago about conscious, being consciously confident. Where, where do you think he was when, you, when he started the lesson? Where, where on that grid? You, you know, it's, it's interesting. He actually came in this day for a full swing lesson. I teach him and his kids. And I saw him hitting some pitch shots the week before. So we went straight into this. And he was kind of afraid to to hit these shots with me because you could see it right away. You're he, like, nah, I don't want to do it. Yeah. He was like, Oh, I'm, I'm okay with that. But you know what? We pressed him a little bit. Um, he was aware he had a technique flaw, but he was actually very much ignoring what was happening. It was just once again, blaming his distance control just for him, just not being consistent with his motion, not on the contact. Hard to control your distance when you don't hit a solid. So to wrap up here, these are questions that I'm asking myself. I'm sure John Scott is asking himself during the lesson. It's like our own little self-talk. Um, and every question leads to a new question. You know, it's, it's what's working well? And then should we leave it alone or not? Sometimes something that's working well for someone, we need to get that out of the way for a minute to go and, 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 and go a different direction. Um, Every question has a, you know, has another question behind it. I think the environment is so important in some of this, like the bottom left one, what information will the player be able to accept at this time? It's, it's like, are they going to go play in 20 minutes? Or are they going to go, uh, or do they have right now where it's, you know, you're not playing golf for three months. And it really, the environment can really affect a person's behavior and their mood. It can affect their tempo, it can affect all sorts of things. So you got to really like go through that process as a, as a teacher. And then when you're working with a player who's a very competitive player, uh, professional or top right amateur, you need to make sure you pick your spots as to what you're going to be doing when. You know, know, know that timeline we talked about in the, in the first session. Know the timeline so where changes can be made and progress can be made. If you've got a little bit of a downtime, you can make those bigger moves and see what happens. But, you know, timeline's important. So I think these next – three slides here are like, I would be screenshotting them. I screen, I saved them when we came up with them uh, the other day, but these are just things that we've come across like teaching in our experience that are little nuggets that can help you like in your everyday teaching or like what path to go on and I'll let Pat handle some of them. But there are all of these, there's three pages of it. They're just awesome stuff. So we had two, uh, two of the players here who had this sweet spot uh, across the target line. So we had two of those today. And, um, you know, I, if I was to write a book about golf, the, the title would be Never Cross the Target Line. I think that's a bad spot to be in. Even when we were teaching bunker lessons, I know years ago teaching bunker lessons, you know, take it back outside in. You know, that's really not the best way to do things. So, I, I mean, in terms of 
the minute that center mask is outside the target line, we're in a little trouble. Um, next one is this, always fix the face first, pass second. Last week we talked about during the ball flight laws, was the shot hit solid? The player says yes. The next one, do you like where the ball started? No, fix the face immediately. The face is a huge one, okay? So fix the face. Um, the next one with the drawer setup, I, th I think everybody understands this, but you would say that at setup, when you put the ball in the front of your stance, it tends to open your upper body up. That's for everybody. And you got to make sure, that, you know, especially the average player, that they understand that that shoulder line being open is going to have a huge effect on the path. And also the top of the backswing, it's going to have a huge effect on the force on the way down, which opened the face up, thinking back to, to, to Jason's swing. If we have more video on that, I'd be curious as to how open his shoulders were at setup. Probably, probably overly open. Um, so the, the one here that I think is really cool is your wrists are going to control the club face, and the hands are going to control, going to control the grip in the path. So the wrists and, are, and the hands can do very different movements. How you hinge the club, vertical, horizontal, um, diagonal, how you're hinging the club is going to really have a direct result on what the club face is doing. So how you hinge it and how you hold the club are really going to affect the club face. I mean, I think a lot of this, when you're working on swing catalyst or a 3D motion plate, you can see like having pressure on both your heels make lower body movement of any kind. It's going to be tough to rotate your hips from your heels. It's going to be tough to like really create dynamic movement when you're, you're stuck in the ground in that way. So that's a pretty good one right there. Uh, using a lot of, using a lot of uh, pressure plates and force plates like John Scott and I do, there's a couple of pressure shifts that we see that are really bad. And in the transition, going back in the right heel, back in the trail foot heel, that's a bad one. Um, so these two right here, if you haven't spent much time on those, you know, make a few practicings feeling when you're making a transition, working back in your trail foot heel and see how awkward that feels. Like at the top of your backswing, if you're, if, if you're shifting for a right-handed player, you're, you're pressure shifting, you're going to go into your right heel at the top but it's not going to go further into your right heel later in the downswing. Like that would say, I would say, I don't think I've seen that. The next one here on the top of the screen, um, our, our player earlier, our second player that we reviewed, who had the comparison with Tiger Woods' downswing, which was really sweet. Um, his backswing, his chest was turned almost 70 to 80 degrees at, at that uh, first parallel. So that'd be one that'd be good for him to observe for his swing and for other students. And then the, this bottom one, this bottom one here, uh, spending uh, some, some, some time on 3D and spending some time on, on gears for golf, there's a pattern in there that a lot of the tour players, when their hips get back to square, meaning back to facing the ball, that the lower body is back to zero. The upper body is 55 degrees closed still. Um, when you looked at a guy um, on, our, on our seminar today, Scott, the guy with the yellow shirt, he broke that rule. His chest was rotated about 100 degrees in the backswing. And when he got his hips back to zero, his chest was almost back to zero. So that'd be, you know, that's, that's poor sequencing. Like, again, like if you, if you think about Rory McIlroy, he, he, he always gets so much credit for how much he rotates through the ball. But if you look at him in lead arm parallel and downswing, he would totally fit in this, in this uh, statement. He has tons of acceleration with his torso later in, your down, in his downswing and through the shot. It's like, it's unbelievable how he can do that. It's super athletic. So it's not like there, he's ro rotating from the, from the start of his downswing. He's in sequence and rotating. So the, um, the first one, the lead shoulder adduction, we talked about the lead shoulder adduction today in terms of when the left arm is getting stuck. Um, and that had an effect in the backswing and the downswing today. Our examples, we had a player who was stuck in the backswing with having the left arm too deep around them. We had a player who was not nearly, not nearly deep enough. We had a player in the downswing who was getting stuck early or, or stuck late. So we have all those examples going. So the left shoulder and the, le and, and the, well, the lead shoulder um, has a huge part of this golf swing and also for sequencing. Um, the next one, spine angle decreasing in impact. We've tested probably 200 plus players on 3D. And we'll say that very rarely we see someone whose spine and impact is lower than it was at setup. And that player, 
those players typically have injuries. So you would be really careful with that. They have a wrist injury, not necessarily a back they have a wrist injury. They could have a foot injury. They could have a spine injury, a back injury. Something's got to give when they're getting close to the ball that much. They got to do something with their wrist or their arms to, you know, save that shot. Um, in short game, I don't know if you guys have spent much time with uh, maybe like a Stan Utley, but a lot of his short game stuff when he's demonstrating and he's doing it from a closed stance. So don't always stick stick with open. You can do square open close to get a lot of a lot of progress. Um, the the bunker one right there. I mean the trail edge one inch behind. That's a good one. Um, typically, they don't. They, when they're trying to get two inches behind, they're trying to get the leading edge two inches behind. That's a bit much. And the last one is try your putting. You know, adjust the setups, adjust the ball position to, to you, adjust someone's aim. You and you can also like adjusting the ball position can really adjust the start direction with it too. The same way we talked about it in the full swing, you're moving it back in your stance might start it more right, up in your stance might start it more left. It's just simple things, cues like that. So I think we have some questions. Okay, um, let's go ahead and we'll answer some questions right now. Can you get them up? I'm, I'm not getting them. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay, we're going to go back and see our questions here. Uh, from Kevin Tanner, how much do you think the forces and torques are innate, and how much do you think the student is adjusting those relative to their ball flight and showing them? How much do you think they're innate, and how much do you think the student is adjusting those forces and torques relative? I think they're always adjusting to what their ball flight is. I think the better the player is probably always adjusting to it. How much are they innate? I think a lot of it comes down to, like, how they're trying to apply power, like, in terms of distance, not, like, force on the club, but in terms of creating speed um, and what some of their concepts are. So, I, I don't – like, in a short answer, that's how I would tackle that. In a long answer, like, we could spend hours talking about that. I think forces and torques, again, it's not – like, we're just being able to measure it with an ENSO machine or, or something that's going to measure, like, the grip or Michael Jacobs 3D. So I think that's like a new, newer frontier, I think, with, with measurement. Um, but like how it applies in, in being, how you can use it as a teacher being steep early and shallow late or um, how it affects the club face, even in, in the torque perception. I think those are huge that we can understand as teachers that can help our students. And I would add to that, the, you know, in Nate, you would say that the wrist and the hands control a lot of what that club is doing. So, you know, they're, they're going to use their arms and hands the best they can to help themselves out. So that's, like, you know. When I think of innate, I think, of, like, I'm trying to think of an example with that. Like Jim Furyk, he's an amazing quarterback. So there's a throwing motion in that. So when I think of innate, like, he has an athletic history of throwing in a kinematic sequence. So his pelvis is always way ahead of where his arms were. That's how you would throw or be athletic. So, like, there's some innate in that. And he learned to do it really well. So that's kind of what I'm thinking when you're asking that. So the next question is, what do you do when changing something in a player's swing and they struggle to do what they need to, to make that work? Example, player comes in steep, hangs back to compensate you, hangs back to compensate, you shallow them out, and they begin to still hang back. So a good one for that is um, if you look at what Jim Hardy talks about, about steep and shallows, which is pluses and minuses, you can explain to this player, look, you're making this move in this downswing, which is a steepener, which we don't want that steepener. And then your conversation move is you're hanging back. There's a shallow. Now, one steep, one shallow, that becomes neutral. That's just a, it's, it's a bad answer there. So you would say, okay, we're going to make one change here. We're going to shallow out the downswing. And then we need to add something to re-steepen this thing out, which would be maybe a lower body move. If you present it to them like it's a math equation, you're trying to get to, the, you know, to a correct answer, you could say we're going to make one move here that's going to take away, one move here that's going to add back. And that's, that's the way I would kind of, you know, balance that out. You can make two moves to overdo the conversation. I would, I would say that the echo the same thing, but I would also say to the student that most things in the golf swing work in pairs. So it's not, it's not as simple as, like, just do this and then that. It's, okay, you, you got them more shallow, but they still have their old fix in there. So it's like if you don't address that as the teacher – like you're not fixing the whole, the whole problem. So 
they, they hang back because they're steep. So if you just fix the, fix the steep part, they're still going to have to hang back. So it's like, that's why you see people or, or you know, get, get really shallow in transition and try to rotate their torso because they're, they're trying to get out of steep and hanging back. Like they, it works in pairs that way. So I would really explain to students, like students want you to say, hey, you had to have a magic wand and say, all right, if I just do this, you know, I'm going to hit every shot good. But it's, it's not that simple. It's, it works, the golf swing always works in pairs, if not, if not more. You, just before we move off of that one, I said last week or two weeks ago, when you make an adjustment to someone, you're adjusting their normal. You're adjusting the way they view the world, how they feel about the world. So now if you can say, look, that one adjustment combined with the second adjustment will have you view things normal again, they'll be okay with it. Um, but, you know, I used to always, when I was teaching, kind of dumb it down for them. I just give them the truth now and explain to them, look, this is, this is the complexity that we're going to do. We're making this one move. The second move is going to counteract it. So if you give them the cause and effects, they're usually more apt to take it. Um, next question. What percent of your lessons are given without a chance to speak with a student and understand what they are looking for before they walk up and meet with you for the lesson? Um, I've got my answer. John Scott, you can go first. I mean, I'm always getting some type of feedback from the student. I'm always, or like before I meet them, um, I would say it's be very rare where I don't have any information about them. I'm not saying all the information is correct, but. So I book all my own lessons by text, email, and phone call. So before a person comes in for a lesson, I've already had a communication with them asking a few vital questions that I'm, you know, what we're doing. Um, so I've already got kind of a running dialogue as to what's happening, but I will say this, if it's a first time lesson, and I tend to do this more with the better player, the competitive player. That first lesson's two hours. If it's a club member coming in who's a weekend warrior, um, I'll tend to hold a little extra time, longer than an hour. So, you know, I don't feel like I'm rushing them in and out, but I will get a bunch of answers beforehand. Um, uh, the swing catalyst, uh, one question is, how do you like the swing catalyst? And what does it cost? So we, between us two here, we actually have two different setups. Uh, John Scott's got the pressure plate, and then I've got the, um, I've got the force plate with the pressure plate. Um, my setup with the force and pressure plate was, I think, about 20000 And when I combined my computer with my cameras, I was upwards about thirty-two to $33,000. I think mine was twelve, and then it's $500, 12000 and it's 500 a year for uh, warranty. They don't tell you that. The, uh, the only, so I'm, I'm able to get the torques and the, and, and, and the vertical forces and the uh, lateral braking force. That's the only difference. Um, do I use that stuff a lot? I use the pressure stuff all the time. The force stuff, I'm glad I have it, but I don't, I, I don't use it nearly as much as I do the other ones. All right, so last question here. I'm going to let you tackle it, Pat. I believe the backswing is meant to feel a stretch in order to generate effortless power. How do you reduce the length of the backswing without removing the stretch? Bethesda member analysis. If the player is not rotating hips, but is already at proper length in the backswing, how do you maintain the length and introduce hip turn? Field swing analysis, thanks. Okay, give me one second here just to so kind like, of think about that. The, the thing that, when I'm reading that, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like at the end of the day, you want them to all match. So it's not like saying you just want a lot of shoulder turn versus no hip turn. Like that would, there's an injury stuff that, and sequencing stuff that are a problem there. And you don't want, like with the Bethesda member, he, he would over rotate. He turned his hips a lot and he turned his shoulders a lot. There was nothing stopping him. So there was no stretch. So to tighten that up, like he created a lot of movement with his, like how far his right arm traveled, right? Mm -hmm. So it would be like creating some of that with it. He was also stood up very like erect at a dress. So like, again, you're gonna create more range of motion that way. So it's not gonna look like very tight or structured back. So I'm going to agree with John Scott on that for sure, is that that player in the backswing, they, they rotated their shoulders, we'll say, 100 degrees. Their hip turn was probably over 50 degrees. And the left arm was stuck against their chest so, so far, and the right arm was behind them. They probably weren't feeling any stretch there as a result. Um, and, I mean, as I watched that guy swing, I just watched it just going in the spin cycle back and through. That's why there was a lot of swing speed, but there was not much speed back in the ball. So um, – if I was trying to get him to stretch, I would have maybe have taken his hip turn and reduced it, which will lock his shoulders up a little bit earlier. 
Um, I would think I would say maybe if that player came back again for a lesson and there was not as much improvement as we need it, I would probably attack the hips next to stop the rotation there. But always when it comes down to it, he had to realize he had to keep his arms more in front of him. That 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 ball, that ball that I use, I'm always telling people, I want you to keep that thing right in front of you, keep it right on your zipper the whole time, as opposed to moving around you. I would look at that with him as well. It's like if you if you take him and you and you reduce hip turn and you reduce you, you, if you pick at that as the like something to like tighten everything up or create a stretch it's going to make him steeper if you don't affect everything else right so like cool. if you reduce your hip turn and your arms still go out like that you're worse off and you know like so it's like create the low get the low-hanging fruit first and then like fix the biggest issue in the room which is how the club is hitting the ball and what affects that and then you can kind of get on that. i think we have one more when you're taking a video of student swing down the line, what is the best position to get an accurate analysis? Like an, an angle? I mean, I think, I think what he's referring to is where to hold the camera. Yes, uh, I've got my answer. My answer is I want the camera lens pointing at the top of the grip. That's where I want it in my studio. That's where I have it. And every single video I shoot, it always looks the same to me that way. So I want the top of the, I want the camera pointing at the top of the grip. Yeah, I mean, I think what, there's so many ways, like Jim McLean films it off the ball so we can see the start direction. Some people have it higher, some people have it low. Like, just make sure you're consistent um, and, and what you're trying to do and make sure it's the same. It's not a measuring device. It's, it's, it's just, it just films movement. It's not like something you're going to say degrees in measuring. Um, so my biggest advice would be be consistent. Okay, that's all we all have. Right. Thank you guys so much. Thank you all so much. Okay.